Welcome again, and thank you for joining our webinar today, Intellectual Property Trends for Life Science Companies in a COVID and Post-COVID World. Today, we'll be hosting a roundtable discussion with four senior in-house IP lawyers to discuss how COVID-19 has impacted their work and careers. Before I hand this over to our co-hosts, my colleagues, Carol Warren-Simon and Amy Katz, recruiters on Major Lindsay in Africa's in-house counsel recruiting team, I'd like to go through a few brief housekeeping items. You should all be able to see the screen right now and hopefully hear my voice. All attendees are in listen-only mode for the duration of the presentation. And as a reminder, the call is being recorded. The recording will be available on our website in the next few days. Um, we expect this call to be about one hour, including Q&A. Speaking of Q&A, please submit your questions and comments using the GoToWebinar console. Just open up the console, type a question, and hit submit. We will take all questions at the end of the discussion, but feel free to submit them at any time. All questions will be anonymous and we will not share your identity with the rest of the audience. We will do, your do our best to get to all your questions today. At the close of today's webinar, a survey will appear on the screen. We hope that you'll take the time to fill it out. It's short and should take one to two minutes tops. It lets us know how we're doing today, as well as some other topics you might wanna hear from us in the future. And we're also gauging when you're ready to return to in-person events. So if you do have a second, please let us know that. With that said, and without further ado, let me turn this over to my colleagues, Amy and Carol, who will set the stage for today's webinar. Thanks so much, Heather, and um, welcome everyone. I'm Carol Simon. I'm a legal recruiter in MLA's San Francisco office. And as um, Heather has already indicated, this is the webinar entitled IP Trends in Life Sciences Companies during and post COVID. I'm delighted to be here today with this terrific panel of IP experts, as well as my colleague and friend, Amy Katz, who is a legal recruiter from MLA's Boston office. Hi, Amy. Hello, all. So both Amy and I do a lot of recruiting work for life sciences companies, including searches for IP attorneys at all levels. And we thought it would be interesting to speak with life sciences IP leaders to see how the pandemic and working from home has affected their practices. We have gathered a group of four IP leaders and assembled a good number of questions for them. And thanks to modern technology, they are with us today to offer their insights and observations. Before we introduce all of them, um, I just want to say that finally, of course, we're delighted to have all of you joining us out there, connected by video as well. We have a pretty full schedule, but if you want to pose a question to the panel, as Heather mentioned, please feel free to do so um, on the questions panel on the GoToWebinar site. If we have time at the end, we will be sure to discuss your question. So um, without any further ado, uh, Amy and I are delighted to introduce our panel to you. Uh, I, since I'm sitting on the West Coast, I will start out by introducing our two West Coast panelists. Um, they are Lori Hill. Lori is the Vice President for Intellectual Property at Genentech, which is a very large biopharmaceuticals company in the Bay Area. Genentech works at all stages of um, drug development from R&D all the way through uh, a number of commercial products. Prior to being at Genentech, Lori was an IP leader at Illumina and Metamune, and she started her legal career as an associate at Morrison and Forster. Lori has a PhD in microbiology and immunology, and her JD comes from the University of Texas. Welcome, Lori. Thank you, good to be here. Great to have you. Also on the West Coast, I'm pleased to introduce you to Wendy Petka. Wendy currently serves as the Vice President of Intellectual Property at Sangamo Therapeutics, which is a very small research and development and early clinical stage biotech company, also here in the Bay Area. Prior to joining Sangamo, Wendy enjoyed an 18-year career in both corporate and law firm settings, where she engaged in small and large molecule activities throughout the product pipeline. Prior to her in-house roles, Wendy worked at Fish and Neve. At the same time, she went to law school and she got her JD from Fordham. Wendy also holds a PhD in polymer science and engineering from the University of Massachusetts. Welcome, Wendy. Thank you. Hello, everyone. 
And we are now on to our East Coast panelists. Um, and I will uh, first start with Moni Ghost. Um, Moni, welcome. Moni is Danaher's Vice President and Chief Counsel of Intellectual Property. And as many may know, Danaher is a science and technology conglomerate made up of more than 20 operating companies in the fields of diagnostics, life sciences, and environmental solutions. Danaher's operating companies include Cytiva, Beckman Coulter, Pantone, and Hatch. Prior to joining Danaher, Moni held roles of progressive responsibility in the legal groups of Bell Labs, Sikorsky Aircraft, and Becton Dickinson. Her experience with different industries and corporate cultures informs her views on professional life and IP practice. These days, she's most excited about being part of the team dedicated to Danaher's future, which is defined by innovation. Moni has a degree in electrical engineering from Purdue University and a JD and an MBA from Indiana University. So glad to have you here, Moni. Thank you. Um, and our last but not least, um, we have from uh, Greater Boston, Todd Spaulding. And Todd Spaulding currently serves as the SVP and head of intellectual property at Alexion Pharmaceuticals, which is a global biopharmaceutical company focused on developing life-changing therapies for individuals living with rare disorders. Headquartered in Boston Seaport District, Alexion has offices around the globe and supports patients in more than 50 countries. Prior to joining Alexion in 2013, Todd also served as an in-house IP attorney with Bristol Myers Squibb and was in private practice with the law firm of Foley and Lardner in DC. Todd has a bachelor's from Brigham Young University, a master's in biotechnology from John Hopkins University, and a JD from the College of William and Mary in Virginia. Also so happy to have you with us today, Todd. Thank you, I'm pleased to be here. Great, um, so let's get started with our first question. Um, and we're gonna start with Lori. Um, Lori, would love to know how has COVID impacted the process of obtaining PTO approvals on patent applications? Yeah, great question. You know, I think um, the it, it has only actually improved how, how we go about doing this because the USPTO, of course, had moved to having um, a certain part of their workforce was already virtual. So in many ways, they were already prepared to step into this all virtual world. Um, so really not missing a beat um, on what we're seeing coming out of the USPTO. But in addition to that, under Director Yonku, they uh, actually reached out across a number of companies and asked, you know, where could we offer improvements and, and, and took it even further. And one of the things, you know, simple things like using DocuSign, signing to do electronic, electronic signatures became possible. And a lot of other things um, really were amped up in terms of availability and the um, ability to work remotely. So they, I have to say, have done a fantastic job and it's made what we needed to do very easy. Thanks, Lori. Um, other perspectives from Todd or Wendy or Moni? Yeah, I'll, I'll agree with Lori. I don't think the patent office missed a beat. And as a company, I think we were able to prosecute more patents to allowance last year than any year in our history, actually. And so the PTO uh, continued to be very effective in the work it was doing from our perspective. I think the real heroes here in our company was our IT team uh, who allowed us to continue to, uh, to do the work that we need to do on our side of that equation. That's great. Moni or Wendy? No, I think I would echo um, what both Todd and Laurie had said. Um, and in fact, we haven't seen any change in volume up or down. It's been pretty steady with regard to allowances and responses, et cetera, through the patent office. And I, and I would just agree with my, with my colleagues. I think, um, I think Laurie said it well. The PTO was ahead of the curve, I think, in, in remote work and setting up the technology to make this uh, viable. And we're seeing the benefits of that. I think it's worth knowing that we've also, um, we had a good experience in 2020 with 
patent offices outside the U.S. as well. Um, we, we, we were able to successfully work with the patent offices in Europe and Japan and every other country where we do work and, and, and really didn't see major impacts from the pandemic uh, anywhere else either. Great. All sounds positive. Any challenges or really all this is really 100% a, a positive uh, evolution uh, in terms of your uh, practice on getting uh, approvals for patent applications? So I do think it remains challenging just, um, you know, uh, doing all work remotely um, is, is, is I think, challenged all of us. And while, you know, I would say for, for my team, we have, have really gotten um, very good at using a lot of the electronic collaboration tools. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty sure those companies have upped their game uh, on a lot of those with everybody being on them all of the time. Um, but there are also challenges, you know, how do you keep connection across the, the team? How is it that you share information? I think all of us miss this spontaneous um, drive-bys that you might have, whether you're at the water cooler or the coffee machine or, or just seeing each other coming in and out of the office. Um, so we've had to find other ways to do that. Um, and I think the additional challenge that we can never forget is that for all of us who have families at home, um, we've all met them. Um, sometimes we've had to adjust our, our times um, and also get really mellow with interruptions, uh, which has been, uh, you know, for me, I actually indulged in a pandemic puppy. And so uh, on more than one occasion, I've had to jump and go, go rescue something that he was destroying. Um, but now everybody knows my puppy. So that's, that's great. great. Great segue to you, Carol. Yeah. Thank you, Laurie. Um, the next question is indeed um, right down that alley. Um, and that question is, how does working from home impact the daily life of IP attorneys? And in particular, the ability of IP attorneys to stay close to scientists and engineers. Um, in my work, I talk to IP attorneys all week long, um, and I'm often hearing from them how important it is to work closely with scientists. Um, so this, this is a question that I've wondered as I've gone through the course of the year and I've, I've adjusted myself to life on Zoom and, and, and WebEx and so forth. Um, Wendy, do you have a, a response sure. to that? How, how do you feel Absolutely. that you have responded? Thank you. Great. Um, yeah, thank you, Carol. So I do feel that it has impacted our team's lives in a in fairly positive direction. Um, we do work more hours, but I think the appreciation of having a flexibility in your own schedule has just been fantastic for everyone. And let me give some examples there. So when we were first forced to work from home, I think that the internet providers were not prepared to have the whole community, including workplaces and school go online. So early on in this pandemic, we were all struggling to have, you know, good uh, bandwidth to be on meetings. Um, and we were really struggling with the community because people were dropping off left and right. So what would happen is we would have to work on, on odd hours. I personally would have to wait till school was over um, on the weekends when maybe more professionals weren't working. Um, as time went on, I think it's become um, a positive thing because some days you might work a typical eight to six days, a patent practitioner or nine to five if you're lucky. Um, but if you have to walk out in the middle of the afternoon and do things you haven't ever been able to do if you were in the office, you can do so, like going to get a passport at the post office that's on, only open so many hours a day. And so what you do is you adjust your schedule and it has worked out quite well. Uh, we trust our, our team members. We know we're always reachable by phone. Um, it has actually brought us closer together as a team. Um, the one thing also, uh, we shouldn't overlook it, especially in the Bay Area and maybe in the Boston DC area is the commute is really tough for a lot of people. So you do gain time back because you're not commuting and you can figure out how you want to reward either the company with that time yourself or some mix of that time. So that has worked out quite well for people. And if now we pivot to the, the second part of that question with regard to the relationship with your R&D folks and how you work with them, I think that has actually um, strengthened 
the ability to work with our R&D folks because we were all forced to get online, but now you've got dedicated time with your people to have discussions about the science or the patent issues, et cetera. Um, the caveat to that is I think it's really important to have had developed those relationships in person um, that made the trust element um, just be very easy when you were having conversations now online uh, for a year. If you didn't meet somebody, so we, we've hired a lot of people in the, in the COVID era, and if you hadn't met them in person, it's really hard to judge expressions online. So it's so much easier in person, you get to know somebody, you get to know what their strengths, their weaknesses are, and you get to be able to work with them in a more robust way. I think that that has been the challenge if we hadn't met the person first. Otherwise, it's worked out quite well for us. So, oh, Lindy, it's just everything's coming up roses for you. That's great. <laughs> My team Anybody loves else? working from home. <laughs> does, does anyone else have a, a comment on that a question? A comment, Carol. Um, you know, Lori mentioned the informal interactions that are so common when we're all in the same space together and. And to a large degree, we had to find ways to replace those. And I found that my team relied more on formal structures in the company, right? We, we rely more on the, the, the project teams, on, on the governance processes that exist in our company to, um, to make sure that, that we're seeing innovation as it's happening and capturing it in, in, in the right time. And uh, and so that's that's a change that I've noticed. You know, it used to be that my team members would walk through the laboratories and almost be assaulted uh, by scientists who were ready to talk with them and share the wonderful things that they were doing. Um, and and without that, we've we've relied on other structures and systems almost as a backup uh, safety net during this this last year. Have they not so worked me, as well? Pardon. Do you think that they have not worked as well? Do you do you miss that personal touch? No, I think they've worked quite well. I think I think what it's what it's meant is that we have to be plugged into the organizational structure within our company, right, and have representation um, where it's appropriate for us to be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's forced. Just Todd, it's forced more formal structures have to be more intentional about is that i think we just been, yeah i just think we've become more reliant on those they they always existed um but we've become more dependent on them yeah i will say for us you know it's been um i think there's been a real exploration of the collaboration tools um and perhaps i don't know that we would have across especially across the the different departments probably have done it quite as intentionally is now we do do it and i'm and i feel sure we'll carry that forward um regardless of how we go back to the office and you know there there are two that i think are are used um a lot you know that's the gchat um type forum there and as as well as slack um so you know it's been interesting because i think before we relied very much on meeting in person and um, we're still having those meetings, but now we have this other dimension um, that I think actually also has fostered community um, because you you can uh, you can put all kinds of silly pictures and jokes and stuff on there too. And and somehow or another, because it feels less formal, it actually builds that camaraderie. So um, I think it's it it definitely has impacted, um, and I and I'm sure like others on the phone, you know, many of our researchers are still in the office um, because they are um, essential workers in keeping the work going forward. And you know, it's a difficult situation um, because they're doing it in a socially distant way, and a lot of the perks of being on campus are not actually there when no one else is there, um, and it just feels different. So I think even with this kind of hybrid approach, um, um, these collaboration tools collaboration have been very meaningful. Very meaningful. You know, I'm, I might just make a comment. Um, I think Dan or her Dan might be a, a little bit of a different a culture. We started um, um, in an industrial in base industrial um, and really focused really on, focused on making, things. making things. And so and as though as to become more of a science and technology, technology organization, organization, it is, it um, is um, that, that, that culture of walking around and going to Gemba, as we call it, is is harder now uh, because obviously we're remote. But I do think we've adapted, um, and 
I think the, the challenge is, is reaching what I, I would call non-traditional groups. So going outside of R&D to go into the commercial organization or the operations team it is a little bit harder, especially as Wendy said, when you don't have the initial connection. Um, but, but I do think that everyone's adapted. And um, that's not to say that we don't look forward to getting on a plane and visiting those, those offices and those manufacturing plants at some point in the future. Um, but but we're doing okay, and I think it I think it will make us think harder the next time we do get on the plane because we know there is an alternative. Uh, but I, I don't think it's a substitute for those face to face conversations that um, that people are missing. Well, good for all of you. I'm impressed. <laughs> Absolutely. It seems like there's been a tremendous adaptation and really a, um, you know, finding um, positive uh, outcomes in what, you know, started off as challenges and now has evolved to a positive way of working together, um, which is terrific. Um, trying to switching gears for a minute now, um, would love to hear about how COVID um, and perhaps working from home has impacted IP litigation. Um, and Todd, perhaps we can start with you and uh, get your thoughts on that topic. Sure. I, I, I was surprised, similar to the discussion we had about patent prosecution, um, we've been able to proceed with our litigations with a few speed bumps, but uh, not major interruptions. Um, we've got district court litigations where we have been able to conduct Markman hearings, um, proceed through fact discovery, uh, conduct depositions, um, uh, have mediation sessions. Um, we've been able to do it all virtually. And, um, and so the courts uh, adapted in that regard for us as well. And, in some ways, I, I think it may even be better for us. Um, there's less travel. <laughs> um, I think it's, it's driven down the cost of litigation for us. Um, and so that, that's that been our experience here in the U.S. We've had some similar experiences outside the U.S. as well. Um, we had a few proceedings that were stalled um, in Europe, um, but they'll resume later this year. So maybe a little bit more of a mixed bag for us on, on, on the litigation front. But overall, the, the same tools that allowed us to continue working in, in other areas um, allow us to continue working uh, in litigation as well um, with, with generally the same success. So yeah, I think it's been a positive. Excellent. Any other thoughts, perspectives on litigation? So I do think, I mean, the experience is often uh, probably district um, jurisdictional dependent um, because, you know, we have seen some things be postponed or pushed out, um, but certainly others proceeding and doing a lot of things virtually. Um, and and it, it is interesting because I think for all of us, whether litigators or prosecutors, there were so many things that we felt had to be face to face. And now we found other ways to do them. Um, and and going forward, I, I think that's you know that will be um, a learning that we can take with us because we don't always have to be in the same room to to do things, and that will alleviate travel um, and it will kind of change the dynamics of of the different things that that are available to us. So um, so you know a challenge that again had a silver lining. It's nice for me to hear that. Um, in many cases, it's the federal government that we're talking about, right? The PTO office, federal courts, uh, regulatory administrative agencies have by and large um, adapted as well as the private sector. And, and um, perhaps I shouldn't be surprised, but I think our poor government always has the reputation of being a little bit behind uh, when it comes to technology. So I'm actually really happy to hear that that has not been the case, in, at least in many, in many instances for, for all of you. Well, and, you know, I think we can't we, we can't overlook the fact that the government, as well as many, many um, public and private companies have have stepped up into actually doing work in a, in a very compressed and fast way to support the work that was yeah. has been done for the pandemic. And so, uh, you know, the, I think the remarkable part is regardless of what we're talking about and where a person sits, we've all been asked to lean in and we have universally seen that across the, the board. 
um, were things being done more effectively, more quickly, um, and steps that maybe we didn't need are, are done differently. Indeed. Well, um, Moni, I'd like to ask this next question to you. Um, as leaders of groups, what have you found to be the biggest leadership challenge presented by COVID? And how have you risen to the occasion? You know, the question, thank you for the question. It's actually really timely. Um, Danaher is a group of companies, as, as Amy introduced, that um, many of which have been acquired um, recently. So, it's, you know, we're acquisitive as an organization. And every time you bring in a new company to the family, there's, there's new people, there is an integration aspect of it. And from an IP perspective, we're really in a build mode. Um, I alluded to the fact that we've got deep roots and, and a legacy in an, an industrial technology. Um, over the past five to seven years, we've really become the life sciences and technology company that we are today. Um, and that's a different IP landscape. So we're, we're in a build mode. Um, we have some very specific IP aspirations and an inability to get together in person. Um, so what we did recently, and I, and I have to say it worked tremendously well after a lot of planning, is, is we did a virtual summit. And, and, we, and we decided that it would be over two days, that four hours a day was about as much as, as people wanted to take in terms of sitting in front of their computers. Um, I think in speaking of an adaptive world, you now have all these companies that will deliver snacks and lunch wherever you are in the world uh, almost. And, and we created, we recreated a, an in-person environment virtually. And um, I think as leaders, the most important thing we can do is, is paint a picture of, of where we wanna go and what's important um, today as well as in the future, set expectations and, and have people, allow them an opportunity to, 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 to reflect on the things that you've just, uh, you've stated and you've created. And whether you do that in person or virtually, I think if it's well planned, it works. And that was the surprising um, um, epiphany, actually, uh, that that many of us had. Um, it does take planning and it does take intention, which is, I think, the theme that we've, we've heard throughout uh, the course of this conversation. Uh, but it's possible. And and I think the leadership challenge is is understanding that um, that people still need contact and they still need they still need to hear you say, where are we going and what's my role in it and, 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 and allowing them to, to have that back and forth with you. And whether you do that once again in person or virtually, I think it works either way. Thanks, Moni. I, the, the, the challenges of well, the onboarding are enormous. I'm hearing some feedback. Um, hope that's not too annoying, but... Um, yeah, the, the challenges of onboarding and welcoming people to an organization um, virtually, I think, are um, actually the topic of our next question. But um, Lori, tell us, and Wendy and Todd, um, tell us a little bit how you have risen to the challenge of connecting with people. I, I you know, Mona, you talked about how um, it, to you it for, sort of feels the same whether the connection is virtual or in person. Um, I don't know if I totally believe that for myself personally. I really miss my teammates, my colleagues. We've um, gotten together for outdoor, socially distanced gatherings for occasionally over the past year. But um, I, I'm curious about um, the rest of you and if you have found some challenges with um, being able to stay close to people that you are, um, that you lead. I, cer I certainly have, Carol. You know, I the nuts and bolts of the work, we found ways to, to get that done. And as we've talked, I think we've all been pretty successful with that. I, I have struggled with um, trying to find an, a, a different leadership style during during the situation. My personal style tends to be one um, that relies on a lot of informal contacts, um, small personal interactions, um, that, uh, that lack the formality of a scheduled meeting and so forth. I've always had an open door policy with my team. And um, when everyone went virtual, it was hard to know, like, is it an okay time to reach out to someone? Am I interrupting them in, in, in the midst of something else they're doing? You don't have the same visual cues that you have when you can peek into someone's office or look over at them at their desk. 
see them walk in the hall and 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 note that it's a good moment and so and so that's been a a really big adjustment for me um is 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 figuring out how to replicate um you know those personal interactions and have it be more organic and natural the the way that uh, it used to be but uh, as a substitute we've increased the frequency of our uh, of our of our meetings um uh, you know, both group meetings and individual meetings that we have together, and um, that, that's been helpful. Uh, we've also identified a few um, things within these collaboration tools that kind of give you a view into what another person's doing, whether they're on the phone, whether they're in a meeting, and, and I've, I've gotten very comfortable uh, just calling people in the middle of the day and uh, not not worrying so much about the interruption aspect as much so you know just adjustments along those lines that helped helped us to get back to um a more normal kind of feeling yeah, yeah that's great i i think that um courage to interrupt when you can't see is probably yeah. what it takes right <laughs> how about you wendy yeah i think it was it's really important to um recognize your folks and let them know that you've appreciated them um, as a leader. And I think it was really hard early on. We were spending all this time, everybody's in meetings all day long. Everybody wanted to show they were working, right? And I, I am a pretty anti-meeting person. I, I like them, but I like them to be very organized and very thoughtful and you know, just get to the point because in our world, we have to spend a lot of time thinking about what we need to do. And so that's part of the reason my small team likes being at home because our part-time at home, because we're able to have that, that ability, you know, eventually we'll go back, we'll see what that looks like. And we can talk about that in some of the other questions. Um, but the appreciation was really important to me. And I continuously let them know they were on the right track. Um, they were doing a good job. I've spent some of my own money to recognize them um, through gift cards, Amazon. Um, for the holidays, I thought really hard about what um, would be important for them um, as individuals. And again, we, we, we as a team talked about the cast of characters, right? You have different personalities. Some people are more introverted, some more extroverted. So how do you find the balance that um, lets everybody know that you, you know, they're very valued in what they how they they operate and so just thinking through how to appreciate everybody was really important for me and so um, we're a small team we all have each other's phone numbers we text each other we um you know we're we're cognizant that you have a life outside of work and we're respectful of that um and so it's worked out quite well for me it might be different in a larger group but that's one of the things that was very important for me to make sure that they they knew they were valued and their work was valued and you know their time was valued so. thank you i i'm sure that's really important yeah um, maybe more than anybody would ever say um especially mm -hmm. on a video right right uh, <laughs> that's that's great wendy how about you Lori? yeah i think for me it's really you know it's all about um really being much more intentional right i think as we move away from kind of uh, good luck um and spontaneous meetings it is about then then how do you stay connected um and and how do you maintain that sense of community so i have to hats off to to many members of my own team who've experimented with a wide variety of virtual happy hours and wine tastings um to uh, book clubs um, but also to a recognition that um, that people are tired and exhausted and what does it mean to stay fresh and um, and energized and so we've experimented with with different um, structures to kind of help with that and one of them is you know we take a day a week and we say we don't have any IPT meetings on that day um, again to to give people time to step back but also um, time to think um, and, and do it, you know, quite intentionally. And then a real commitment to to kind of taking our meeting skills to the next level. And and how do we do that? You know, um, having them be shorter, be more thoughtful, um, invest in in doing more work upfront um, so that the meetings are shorter. And then celebrate every time a meeting ends early. Um, because one of the shocking things I think you really realized when we were at home is that often 
you just filled up the space if you had walked over to a conference room to be there. So even if you didn't need to talk, somehow or another, it went on and on. Yeah. And so it, it's become a real pleasure to to go, well, okay, so you have 10 minutes back, you have 15 minutes back. Um, and and uh, people really appreciate that. And, you know, it allows us a level of flexibility we haven't had before. Um, so it's it's been it's been interesting. I guess the other thing that I would just share is you know the the ability to be casual and have fun and um, and poke at each other and share pictures of walks and pets and 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 different things we've been able to do using virtual tools. I feel like um, you know we hear from people we probably didn't hear that much from before because our introverts really leaned into to all of that. Um, and but we were able to share portions of our lives that we didn't we didn't ever think about, um, and so that has really been such a celebration and a community builder across the organization. As we, um, I think all of us now have at least one new pet, um, and so you share stories across those. And and but then just the beauty of walking outside, um, and and you know what that looks like. And and Carol, you had mentioned. Um, doing socially distanced walking. We have we have groups of our folks that get together as we live across different areas of the of the bay um, and do the socially distant walk and and how wonderful it is um, to be able to do that. Yeah. We're very lucky in yeah. the bay to have the weather that permits, um, for the most part, uh, being Indeed. able to gather outside. You you guys on the east coast have had to endure more in it's more coming. inside time. Uh, before we discuss uh, this topic, if, if you don't mind, I, actually, I think there's an important aspect of this that, that I want to share. Um, for those of us with big teams, you, you know, 70,000 associates around the world, including ADIP people that wow. operate, in, you know, in China and Asia and other places, what I have heard is, is that this remote work has been a great equalizer. So when, when we used to get together in DC and there would be six of us in a room and, and, our, and our Chinese colleague was up at 2 a.m., still might be up at 2 a.m., but, you know, they did not feel like they were missing something because they weren't in the room with us in D.C. And now that is gone because we're all um, in the same boat. So I have to say that I, I think it's I think there's been some tremendous positive aspects of, of the recognition that that you don't always have to all be in the room with each other. And for a big company like Danaher, that's, that's been very important. Agreed. It's it's amazing how the adaptation has been, and I'm hearing so much positivity. Um, obviously, there's been challenges, but um, it, it's it's a quite a remarkable pivot, I think. And it'll be interesting in 10 years as we look back on this how um, how it has ch how it changed the work life, how it changed the, the 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 barrier or lack thereof between work and home life, and and um, and and all of those things. Um, and maybe how it did even the playing field a little bit, Moni, to your point. I, I think that's excellent. Well, speaking of time, um, I am mindful of our time and um, don't want to run over. We, we still have some time left, but we have a couple more questions. So I'm going to pass it back to Amy. And maybe we'll just, I think our final two questions are um, among our best. So I don't want to cut them off. But um, so let's tr maybe uh, power through these a little bit more quickly, if possible. Um, Amy? Sure, absolutely. And, and I, I too am struck by the positivity um, that I'm taking away from this conversation. And I think a lot of it has been based upon having technology that has helped us adapt and relationships that have existed that have allowed to endure and, and be very positive going forward. Um, so I'm curious about sort of thinking even more forward about when you don't have people in your organization um, already, how has COVID changed the way you might view um, hiring for IP? Or how has, has COVID at all impacted the way the company views um, IP? Um, Todd, I guess, love to start with you on that. Sure, I, in terms of the way the company views IP or the, the role it plays in our strategy and so forth, I, I don't think that's changed at all. Uh, the way that we hire for IP, um, the situations caused us to really open our perspective on, on that. And I always had an idea that, that IP lawyers are best co-located with the scientists, um, where all those interactions that we, we talked about missing can happen. Um, but uh, 
we've realized that we can be quite effective um, when we're not actually physically located with each other. And so we started hiring people who live nowhere near any of our offices, right? We're a Boston-based company. I, I hired a lawyer in Ohio, um, <laughs> you know? Um, we hired people on the West Coast, even though we're centered on the East Coast. Uh, and it's been great in that we have a broader base of talent that's available to us than, than, than we used to have. And we know that we can be effective working together. And so one of those sort of false restrictions that we put on ourselves previously, we've, we've been able to lift that. And I think going forward um, that, that we will always have that, um, you know, we're not gonna revert, I, I, I don't think, because we've seen that we can be really successful bringing great talent into our organization and get the best people no matter where they are. Great. That, um, that is very positive to hear, and we have certainly seen that trend um, on our end at MLA. Um, Wendy, Moni, Lori, um, thoughts from you as to how any changes in the way the company view IP and or the way you hire for IP um, professionals on your teams? So certainly no changes to how IP is viewed. Um, I, I think uh, we we are and will be a, a strategic business partner that's highly valued. Um, on the hiring process, you know, it's it's been interesting um, to to go all virtual um, during the hiring, and especially um, because you know often um, before uh, you know the a big part of the decision always was you know whether or not to come to the Bay Area. Um, you know, and and how we went about all those processes, we had to change as well. And I think, you know, looking forward, there is a, an, an added dimension of flexibility. We've had multiple folks that have joined us um, during this past year who, um, someone who's in DC and, and, and other places across the United States, and, and we've adapted. And we've had people actually from our own group who, are, who have homes um, elsewhere, who have gone there um, for different periods of time as well. So we've really been able to leverage uh, the adaptability um, and the flexibility uh, across all of that. I think in the long run, you know, there probably will be changes in our practices across Genentech. I think we're doing that as a company-wide initiative, so that's still under discussion. And for, for those of you on the West Coast, you know this is a hot topic right now, um, especially because of the very long commute. Um, in the Bay Area. And so, you know, I think now we do have a, 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 a really nice set of opportunities to rethink what does it mean um, to be at work and why are we at work? Um, and, you know, I think that community is important. I, you know, certainly for innovation, I think that there's so much to be gained by being co-located, um, but there's still a lot of flexibility that we can have as well. So um, while we haven't settled on all the specifics, certainly we're taking that into account. Um, and, and I think it will be a very positive thing for us across the entire ecosystem. Thanks. How about Moni or Wendy? Any changes that you've seen other than the geographic focus, which clearly we're hearing is, uh, it's been a much broader focus and not uh, feeling like folks need to be located where your labs are, where your offices are. Um, any other changes that you've seen in the way your companies or you hire for IP professionals? I don't think uh, there's no, uh, in terms of strategy and what the company wants from an IP perspective, no change. Um, I actually think people uh, are also recognizing that they don't have to move. And, um, and so, the fact that they're applying for a job in DC and they live in California, you know, they're not moving from California and, and that's okay. And so I think as much as we have that expectation of we're flexible, I think the the, the talent pool is equally um, rooted in that expectation that they can live wherever they want. I think I think that's a great thing. Yeah, I would have to agree with all of that. We we haven't hired in my department or in my group. So um, we will be, so I hope. Um, and I do think that this, um, this time has really opened people's minds about what is needed for that role and whether you have to have boots on the ground or you could be remote and visit, et cetera. 
Um, so that's that's actually a really positive thing because in my past life, we talked a lot about generational differences and work styles. And uh, I think this is now an opportunity for us to all change and, yeah. uh, and accommodate that, so. Speaking of equalizer, right, Wendy? Yes. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I, I'll just say really quickly, um, to, sorry to just add my recruiter's two cents, but uh, I'm sure Amy sees this in Boston as well. But as a recruiter, we, we have seen a sea change on, on this very issue. Employers mm -hmm. who used to say, no, these people have to be here. They need to move. They need to uproot their families and all their children and they have to move to the Bay. Um, th there is much more flexibility about that um, right now with employers. You know, there's still... Um, not everybody is fully on board, but I, we're seeing a lot more openness to it. And I think in major metro areas like San Francisco, uh, where commutes are miserable and where real estate is very expensive, this really does open up a lot of hiring possibilities. Uh, so it's a, I think it's a very positive development. And, and so I guess the flip side that I'd love to hear from folks about, and again, maybe we'll start with you, Todd, is how do you integrate new employees um that have gone through a virtual um recruiting process who may be living in a separate place that um likely um you haven't met in person um how do you integrate new employees and then i guess the corollary to that is do you have any suggestions for new hires um when they are uh, on a new team how they're going to meet expectations in a remote world yeah i think for us onboarding it makes it, it, it makes an, an onboarding plan that much more important. Um, you know, we we've always tried to have a plan and, and and outline exactly, you know, first 30, 60, 90 days, who to meet, what to do, trainings to complete, all all, all of those sorts of things. Um, I think in this environment, that that becomes all the more important as a guideline for for, for your new hire. And so. Um, I'd, I'd commend that to, to everybody. Uh, for, for the new employee, I don't know um, if anything has changed that dramatically in terms of advice I would give them, um, but uh, you know, be proactive in reaching out. At, don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, you, you know, it's, uh, I think it takes a little bit more courage to accept a job in this environment and, uh, and and it takes a little bit more courage as you're integrating to uh, to ask the questions, to reach out, and um, be 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 more assertive and, and less passive than you might otherwise have the luxury of being if if we were in a normal situation. I'll also add that I think also it behooves us as leaders to make sure that we're letting them know who the right people are to talk to at least initially until they get their feet wet. Um, and that can be substantial, right? You walk into a new organization, you don't know what the org structure is. And so having been here, you may know who's important people for them to set up meetings and maybe ask to even help in that regard as well. Um, I would also suggest that they make IT their best friend because our <laughs> IT department has completely changed my life. <laughs> so. That's great. Get to know the IT folks before the patent <laughs> folks. <laughs> yeah, right. I do think, I, I mean, I think as we bring, um, we onboard folks, it, it, you know, a couple of things, the IT, making sure it works and, and you can access it is, is of course key. And, and sometimes there's a hiccup here or there, but just always be patient. Um, but the other thing is, is, you know, I have found with the, because we're having to take greater intentionality and we're making sure that people aren't in too many meetings and this sort of a thing, but actually the onboarding um, has been really, um, really effective, you know, to bring people in. Um, the first couple of weeks, we have a couple of uh, a drop by um, either wine chats or, or, um, or breakfast meetings where, where people just can drop in just like you would in an office um, and drop in for a few minutes and chat to everybody who's there and then drop off. And it's really been very effective at, at, at having people feel like they're part of the community. Um, and again, I think because we're all in the same boat, then you know when you think about some of the hard part about being new is the fact that everyone is comfortable and 
um, and you're the new person. But now it's a much more lay, you know, level playing field if you're going to speak up or, or put questions in chat or whatever that is. So I, I have found the engagement to be just really tremendous, um, no matter how long people have been there. But the, the new people have had a had a, a really significant impact very early. That is great to hear. Any um, comments on this question, Moni? I'll, I'll make it quick. I, I would say that um, as a new person, and I would encourage any any time you're meeting someone for the first time, um, maybe over-index on humanity a little bit um, at the start of the meeting. Say something about yourself um, it, it, instead of diving right into the topic at hand. I think it's 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 the substitute for the running into someone in the hall and grabbing uh -huh. lunch is is that little bit of humanity at the beginning that really goes a long way. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, Thank you. thanks, Moni. Well, we are coming to an end, so I'm just gonna ask our final question. Um, and that is, what have you learned during the pandemic that will take you forward into, I'm sorry, that you will take forward into your business once life is back to normal? Um, and I, uh, I love the, over index on humanity, Moni. I think that's a great phrase. <laughs> uh, Laurie, how about you? What will you take forward? Yeah, I'm happy to start. I think, you know, one thing I just want to honor with, the, with all the positivity that we've had here is that, you know, for many people, this has been a, a tragic and difficult time um, where people have lost loved ones, um, people have gotten sick and they haven't gotten well. And um, and then we've missed key events in our lives. Um, so you know, it, it. I think the the resonance of how important family, friends, and community are can't really be overstated. And what I will take forward is how important it is to really make welcome the 360 of the individual at the office. Um, we've now all done that. Um, we've seen each other's homes and, and family members and, and renovation projects and disasters as they happen. <laughs> um, and we've and we've had to and we're supporting mourning sometimes with our colleagues as they go through the tougher time of this. And I think that we just the the important part is that we are regardless mm -hmm. of how focused we are in our work, we're still human. And I think bringing that in and, and treasuring it and making a place for that is something that we can't forget going forward. Well said. Thank you, Lori. How about you, Wendy? You just said it so perfectly. Um, <laughs> I think <laughs> I think that, you know, I think we're all just way more flexible. And I'll take that forward and I will trust my people and, um, you know, I'll give them a lot of flexibility because I know what great things they can do. That's great. That's really great. How about you, Todd? I want to really appreciate my team and that I can trust them um, to work far more independently and uh, exercise far more judgment um, in this, you know, environment. They've had to do so and um, they've just been so good at it. And for me as a leader to, to be more flexible. Um, I've learned that a lot of my prior notions about what's important and how things need to be done um, just, just don't hold up. Um, and so uh, I need to be uh, very open-minded as we go forward and continue to, um, to question my own assumptions and listen to my team and trust them and uh, yeah, so I, I, I think those are those are some leadership qualities that uh, that I've been able to make progress on and that I'll take forward. That's great. That's great. Moni, you get the last word on this. Wow, thank you. Um, I'm trying to think of something pithy to say, but uh, it's probably not going to come out that way. Um, but I do think that intention can make up for space. So um, if, if you are intentional about every conversation that you're having, even if it's via video, but um, your humanity shows through and, and what you're trying to say is 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 real. Um, it's not the same as, as giving someone a hug for sure or, um, or or being across the table from them over a meal, um, but it's pretty close. And, and I think that, um, you know, I think we should all celebrate that. We found yet another way to connect as humans across 
time zones and continents, and I think that's a good thing. Yeah, all right. Well, gosh, everybody, um, thank you so much to the panelists. Thank you, Amy, for joining me in this venture. Um, it, what a great conversation. Um, I'm inspired by all of you. I really and truly am. And I, uh, what your, your teams are very lucky. I think you're all really thoughtful leaders and um, have, have grown through the process and, um, and helped, helped others along. Um, that's Heather's way of saying it's time to talk, stop talking and I'm going to turn this back over to Heather because actually she gets the last word. So Heather, <laughs> finish us up. So thank you. And I was going to say since we are, I'm going to take the panel's advice and we are going to give everybody back a few minutes of their hour. Everybody gave that as a tip. So everybody gets three minutes back. Thank you. Although we'd really like it if you take our post webinar survey, which might take a minute or two but I promise it'll just be like two minutes, so you'll get a minute back. So thank you to <laughs> Carol and Amy, and to Todd, Wendy, Lori, and Moni. Thanks for doing this with us today. And um, everybody be well, and have a great afternoon. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you.